I'm sort of speechless today. <laughs> it's a nice day, but uh, one in which the ex president is supposed to keep his mouth shut, I think. Don't you? It's very nice to have so many people from so many institutions and so many old friends mm -hmm. who have come back today to back participate to in this celebration. Mm -hmm. It was my privilege 26 years ago to award you your bachelor's degree and 25 years ago your master's degree. And here I am today still talking your ancient kibitzer proudly voicing congratulations. This array of coincidences in your career and mine speaks to the fact that as an MIT president you are uniquely an MIT product. No past institute president was so completely indigenous. A matter for self-congratulation in the MIT community, especially on the part of the faculty. What do you think was the highlight of all these inaugural festivities? Well, I think the highlight was that the spirit was still the spirit of that first faculty meeting when they found out that Paul was president. Room 10250, I've never seen so electrified as it was that day when the faculty came in and, and everybody knew that Paul and, and Paul marched in with Dr. Wiesner. I've never seen MIT so warm and so uh, just such a delightful place. President and Mrs. Gray, distinguished friends, of the Institute. Welcome to this inaugural symposium, the first one of the series on information, entitled, as you heard, Computers and People, Future Partnership or Conflict. It is appropriate, I think, to have such a symposium at this time. After all, we're well into the information revolution, the course of which promises to affect and be affected by this institution under Paul Gray's presidency. I may end with a play on words because there is, as some of you know, that lovely remark in Faust, which he says that Grau teure Freund is aliteri in grün des Lebens golden Baum. Gray, dear friend, is every theory and green alone life's golden tree. We have here a Mr. Gray who's being put in as the president of MIT. <laughs> I know that theory will be gray, but he will make MIT green. Thank you. The main thrust of my talk will center on the privacy issue. This, to my mind, is the most immediate social issue raised by computers. More prominent than computer-generated unemployment, and certainly more pressing than questions such as whether we are in danger of becoming computer-dominated. Present-day computer capabilities on the one hand, and existing governmental and private sector information gathering practices on the other hand, compel us to consider the privacy issue now.
much above the top of the uh, of the driver's building, but you get a good view of the court and all the activity here. You think this is a good way to begin the inauguration? Indeed, indeed. of this symposium, The Other Energy Crisis, is thus an ironic play on words. There is a biological energy crisis in the sense that growing numbers of people are simply not getting enough food energy to lead full productive lives. The limiting factor, with some largely unnecessary exceptions, is not yet food production, but distribution and consumption. Food is produced to meet, effect, to meet economic demand, not human need. And the challenge of meeting human needs requires a degree of distributive justice that in turn depends on political, economic, and perhaps structural changes in societies that are often strongly resisted by power elites. To you, sir, I bring greetings from the original technical university in the United <laughs> Kingdom. <laughs> And congratulations on the much greater success of our sister university in the United States. We wish you, sir, as you embark on your new term of, of, of office as the 14th president, enormous success both to yourself and to the institution. Thank you for inviting me to be present. Ladies and gentlemen, the subject I've taken for my, my paper this afternoon is oil for breakfast. The reason becomes apparent. Virtually all the triumphs of modern agricultural science, which has given the developed countries the most varied, most cheapest, the cheapest, and the most hygienic diet in recorded history, involve pouring fossil fuel into our food systems to produce more food. As I shall hope to demonstrate, we indeed eat oil for breakfast.
Good morning. Good morning. What do you think? The, what are these numbers for? I'm not sure. I guess they're the order of the procession, the order of March. What's your name? My name is Frank Duhay. I'm the mayor of Cambridge. That's right, you are. Yes. Oh, that's right. Tell yes. us about this inauguration as far as the city of Cambridge is concerned. Well, of course, the city of Cambridge is very pleased, and we have decided that the weather will be nice this morning. I think uh, all these people who've arrived from all over the world to come for it, it adds uh, a certain meaning to it, you know, beyond MIT. So I, mean, I think we're all going to have a great time. What do you think of this very important inauguration? Oh, I'm very much impressed. Very much impressed. Of course, I'm an alumnus and I'm slightly warped in favor of MIT. But I think this is the best one ever. Very special. Yeah, and I think that the former presidents would say that. Even, even the old man. Colors like Cecil Green, alumni who keep coming back and yeah. needling the pr yeah. presidents that make Why don't you do this? Why, why don't you do, do that? that? Yeah. Yeah. Cracking the whip. It's a rare occasion to have so many presidents, and they're not fighting together either. <laughs> well, yes, it's, a, it's a delight to be here with this collection of presidents at this institution. A very happy day. A lot of people are saying that they are very excited that you're going to be the next president. How do you respond to that? Well, I'm very excited too, Paul. It's a marvelous opportunity and a great responsibility and a little humbling, a lot humbling. Are you nervous today? Yes. <laughs> It's been an exciting day already, and the next hour is going to be unbelievable, I suspect. Nervous? Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, guess, I just hope they all follow me. Well, the thing that's so heartening about this moment is everyone goes by, they say good luck and best wishes, and they mean it, and it will take a lot of good luck and a lot of people working together to make MIT move ahead. It's very encouraging. And did you notice the sun is coming out? Indeed. <laughs> Just at the right moment. Yeah. Corporation and the faculty of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology are now declared convened together with this assembly to join in the inauguration of Paul Edward Gray as 14th president of the Institute. May I ask you now to again please rise while Virginia Wilson Gray Army offers the invocation. We are gathered here today to celebrate many gifts. We celebrate with a deep sense of pride and satisfaction the inauguration of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's 14th President, Paul Edward Gray. And we thank you not least of all, Lord, for allowing this ceremony to be outside and for the sun to shine on all of us. To summarize our feelings, all of our feelings. 
about Paul Gray and to salute him on this occasion, I call on the senior former president of MIT, Dr. James R. Killian, Jr., for whom this court was appropriately named in 1974. Dr. Killian. became one of the best liked and most respected teachers in your department. It was soon recognized that your first-rate performance as a teacher was matched by first-rate talent as an administrator, and you were quickly co-opted from one administrative job after another. In fact, you hardly had the opportunity to arm the chair in one post before you were drafted for another. Paul Edward Gray, by the authority of the corporation and with the enthusiastic approval of the faculty, the alumni, and the student body, and this distinguished assembly, I present into your keeping the charter of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and invest you with all of the authority, privileges, and responsibilities of the Office of President. May you serve the Institute and dignify its Office of President with all the skill, wisdom, and dedication which our confidence accords to you. And may your administration be memorable. Well. <laughs> Most of my adult life has centered on the surroundings of this magnificent courtyard. The dominant emotions I feel are those of profound respect and humility. For this place expects and deserves uncommon performance from those who are privileged to serve it. As MIT enters a new decade, it takes its place in a world whose prospects for peace and justice are uncertain. A world in which economic security, literacy, and health are not enjoyed by most people. With all our progress, poverty is still the only prospect and hunger a condition of life for a shockingly large portion of the world's people. Here in the United States, in the midst of a presidential election year, there is a widely shared sense that many of the old values and old ways are not appropriate somehow to these times. And yet, change requires leadership from MIT. It is our responsibility to help develop the full range of talent and potential in our society. MIT has a responsibility to itself and to the nation to be open and indeed to reach out to the most talented and promising people, regardless of race or sex. We must preserve our unswerving commitment to the quality and vigor of our core activities in engineering and science. We must do so in ways that respect the integrity of basic science, in ways that uphold the values of applied science and technology, and in ways that reflect and engage the social context in which science and technology occur. We continue to hear the complaint that the world has had too much of science and technology that many of our human and social ills are the direct result of unanticipated and deleterious artifacts of technology foisted upon the world by technicians with tunnel vision. Ultimately, I believe, this inquiry and these enterprises must rest where they begin, 
with concern for the human condition. We must continue to be a sanctuary for the constructive criticism of the technological enterprise and of the larger society. These principles must be built into the academic programs of our students, both undergraduate and graduate. We have a responsibility to educate our students for civilized leadership as professionals and citizens of the world. Thank you very much. From the heart, I thank you. Look over here. Yeah, roll it. Okay. One more. Six. Anybody else from the graduating class in the 40s? Yes. Right over here. Let's go. Let's go. I don't know what even it is. Okay, if you can look right over here. One more. Hustleblood. Hustleblood. Victor Hasselblad, he makes a lot of money. You look right here. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, if everybody, make sure I can see the lens. Can you film in that camera? Oh, yeah. Okay, you ready? You can look right this way. And just one more. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege for me to call upon Derek C. Bach, president of Harvard University. As a neighbor, I look forward to a continuing and close cooperation with this glorious institution. As a university president, I look forward to hearing a strong new voice for science and for academic research. But most of all, as a citizen, I look forward to a source of enlightenment to guide us in the wise development and use of scientific knowledge. And so as you begin your term, Paul, you have our respect, our hopes, and our warmest good wishes. Thank you very much. This is about the, my Uncle Harold. Uncle Harold was famous for lying. He had once been shot right between the eyes. He told me so himself. It was during World War I. An underage boy, he had run away from home, enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, and been shipped to France, where one of the Kaiser's sh soldiers had shot him right between the eyes. It was a miracle it hadn't killed him. And I said so the evening he told me about it. He explained that Marines were so hardy they didn't need miracles. What I like to recollect is that he could remember being born. He told me about it one night. He could remember the very instant of birth. His mother was pleased. <laughs> and the doctor who delivered him, Uncle Harold could remember this distinctly, said, it's a boy. <laughs> there, were several, there were several people in the room, and they all smiled at him. He could remember their faces vividly, and he smiled back. Thank you.
Weren't you just a little tired this morning? No, I'm still on adrenaline. <laughs> what do you think was the highlight of the inaugural activity? The highlight of the inaugural activity was the inauguration speech. It was superb. Uh, it's just the kind of note that has to be, it should be struck, and I'm delighted he struck it. Well, I'd be reluctant to say what was the highlight until we sample this. <laughs> <laughs> What did you think of the inauguration? What did I think of it? It was yeah. beautiful. You think it was worth all the effort? It certainly was. Sure. What did you think? Very nice. Very nice. Glad the sun came out. Did you have any major problems? No, nothing. Where's one? Everything Talk worked fine. One. What do you have to do now, and how long will it take you to dismantle this whole thing? Oh, a day. A day or two. John, talk, will you? <laughs> I'm busy up here getting the thing off. Okay.